Hey gang, it is Wednesday. You know what that means? It's hump day. I'm going light tonight. Got to pack after the show. Got a 6 a.m. flight tomorrow. But I'm still stoked that it's hump day. We've got an amazing show. This is Dennis in the Know, your backstage pass for current trends, politics, and education in the dental world. It's live. And as it always is, over a cocktail, or if you're going to be a, a little sissy like me, a light beer tonight because I have to pack. But hey, it is what it is. Anyway, you know the routine. I'm here with my besties, Dr. Jennifer Bell and Dr. Chad Duplantis. We are all practicing dentists. We are all educators. And we are all business owners. And our job is to bring all of you guys in the know. Well, we'll take... Uh, we're going to go back a little bit to what Jeff was talking about with a lot of the direct to consumer and, and, uh, interesting plays in the dental market. And, you know, an, an interesting post was put up this week about Walmart now seeking dental health care providers to be able to provide dentistry in their, uh, community stores. Um, and they've opened a few, uh, Paula Cat just posted projected 200, uh, to be opened, or at least they've discussed and planned for 200 of these dental locations. I had heard about this a few years ago, and then it sort of fizzled out. I think COVID put a little bit of a damper on that, but it seems like it has picked up momentum again. And, you know, Target launched whitening uh, kiosks or stations in their facilities not that long ago as well. And I think it brings up some interesting topics for us as dentists and certainly as we look at our advocacy organizations to see what opportunities we have to continue to better the profession. Maybe this is exactly what the profession needs. Maybe it's the exact opposite of what the profession needs. But certainly we as dentists and healthcare providers for patients should have a seat at the table to sort of help direct uh, the, the ship a bit for how consumers uh, achieve and receive dental care in our communities. And so I think it's it will continue to be a topic that we need to discuss. And unfortunately, it sort of piggybacks on some additional webinars that I watched this week that were presented by the ADA. I will give the ADA immense amount of credit. Over the last couple of years, they have been incredibly diligent about collecting data from dentists on a very regular basis, almost weekly. Um, from dentists in private practice to try to continue to gauge uh, activity levels on the ground, in the trenches, seeing patients every day. I think this started as a COVID project so that they could be responsive to dental needs quickly to figure out what was happening on a local front. But it sort of morphed into this very interesting data accumulation project that they've developed. And post-COVID, we're seeing some really interesting trends in data happen and it's really thanks to the ADA continuing to collect that information. So they sent out, I, I had a couple of links to watch some of the webinars. And because I'm a bit of a dork, I consume this information on a regular basis. So I, in between patients over the last couple of days, I've been watching some of the webinars that they posted. And I will tell you, if you really want to get bummed out during the middle of the day or your lunch just isn't exciting enough, you can watch these webinars to really get depressed about potentially where the current state of dentistry sits. There's a lot of good things happening. Dentists are back in the workforce force, full force. They are um, treating patients pre-pandemic levels. There's a lot of activity for them to be able to provide dentistry. There was a really interesting statistic that I thought was worth mentioning this evening. And it was comparing the rate of inflation and the rate of consumer spending within dentistry and the cost of, de of dental services. If we look back over the last 25 years, dentistry has always trended slightly above the consumer price index for average goods and services, which was a good place to be. Maybe people thought our prices were slightly high, but we were always just above the inflation line of consumer pricing index. In the last year, we have fallen quite a bit below the price index, consumer price index, almost 4% below which you might think is not that much, but it's pretty significant when we've always been one to 2% above. And when you comp compound that with the fact that many doctors have not been able to increase fees because of in-network participation, and they're seeing rising costs because of those inflationary 
and consumer price index uh, rates being present, uh, I do worry about the future of dentistry and what this, these compounding effects are going to be. In fact, in our pre-show with Doug, we were talking a little bit about what will that look like if a lot of these DSOs and PE firms want to start making offers on practices because there's a there's a tremendous economic compression. I don't know the right answer. I think it continues to be a topic we should be discussing and discussing regularly. It's incredibly complicated and far outside of what dentistry really is. Um, it's an economic um, propensity I think we have towards maybe seeing a fundamental shift in dentistry and uh, we can't sit back and wait for that to happen. So, you know, advocacy is going to be a big part of this, open conversations with our peers. And as Chad really mentioned, health, mental health services as well for dentists who are experiencing burnout or that financial compression to make sure that everybody's well-being will come through this particular dip or change in the economic status of dentistry in an okay fashion. We've got one of my favorite people, um, mm -hmm. just a, a brilliant guy, and I don't want to make him wait any longer. So um, many of you who've been around with us for a while, I have had the pleasure of chatting with Dr. Doug Thompson before. Doug is a friend. He's been an instructor at the Koi Center for a long time and a and a big advisor uh, in, in science and a contributor to the Koi Center where so much of the education that that Jennifer and and myself, you know, having gone through that whole program, really base a lot of what we do in practice on those teachings. And for me, a lot of what what this gentleman has taught me. Well, um, early on at the Koi Center, um, John would let Doug do some presentations on periodontal medicine, and I call it periodontal medicine as opposed to periodontics because Doug always included that oral systemic piece. He was one of the earliest people to really talk about salivary testing and how much a bacterial load can impact the cardiovascular health of a patient and how we're really, we really should be treating more towards systemic health than towards just dental wellness. And so Doug, um, after really gaining a, a lot of traction with his teachings, started something called the Wellness Dentistry Network, which I am a member of, a very proud member of. Um, I can't tell you how many resources there are and how much he has put together. Um, he's the guy that turned me on to Bale and Deneen and, and to doing the preceptorship so I could understand cardiovascular disease uh, in a better way. Doug introduced me to that. But Doug started this Wellness Dentistry Network. He has authored um, chapters in books that have been written alongside of the medical profession, very well recognized in, in that area of oral medicine. And um, I'm just really proud to have you here again, Doug. I don't wanna, uh, I, I don't wanna blow your head up too much, but you've had a big impact on me. And, uh, and really what, you were so far ahead of your time. And it's, I know it's gotta be really very pleasing to you to see the medical profession embracing this now and to see dentistry embracing it now and to know, you know what? I wasn't so crazy in doing all this. So Doug, welcome. And, and maybe you'd like to speak to some of those points about the profession kind of coming around and saying, you know what? This guy was way ahead of it. Well, you know, thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Chad, and thanks, Jennifer. I was uh, I enjoyed listening to the whole intro and some of the concepts. You know, I, I don't mind talking about current education. I don't mind talking about growth and development. I probably won't talk too much about politics. That's a whole different deal. Uh, however, when we do talk about politics, I mean, you know, or insurance, you know, the beverages are in order. So I know that's part of it. <laughs> so I'm good with that. Um, but no, Jeff, I uh, I really appreciate the kind comments and. 
And you know, in 2017, in 2018, the you know the American the American Academy of Periodontology and the uh, the European Federation of Periodontology got together and they started to create this thing called staging and grading. And it was a it was a new way for us to look at periodontally diseased patients, and it allowed us to look at like radiographs and bone levels and clinical attachment loss and and what the old AAP classification did was it just made us look at that stuff and said, here's where this patient is, is a snapshot in time. We don't know if their disease is active or stable, but what the staging and grading uh, criteria did was it allows us to stage the disease a lot. Like if you had cancer, the first thing you'd ask your doctor is what stage is it? If you get prostate cancer, you want to know like how severe is it? And so that's what staging does. And then what the grading system did is it let us know about the rate of progression of disease. And you know what's interesting? The two things that changed the way the disease might progress was a smoking habit. Now, that's an environmental thing. That's things that we do that make perio worse. But the next thing on the list that creates a big deal in grading, if you haven't been down this road, is if you have elevated um, blood sugars, HbA1c. And if you have an HbA1c above seven, now all of a sudden your disease is worse. So guess what happened in 2018? And it's still not even adapted today. They're adopted today widely by everybody. Oh, it's the common language among periodontal community. But as far as the insurance companies and all those those uh, benefit plans, they're so far behind. You know, they're mm -hmm. five years behind. But what did it do? It now launched us into the medical world where it says, hey, not only is this disease a, a, a dental condition that can affect your teeth, but you know what? There's a medical component to it too. And there's a medical component to it too. So if I can give your team or if I could give your listeners all these, uh, the, the Dinks uh, people that are, on the, that are on the webinar tonight or that are going to be on the webinar because I know thousands of people watch this after the webinar actually happens, mm -hmm. it would be this. When you diagnose a disease, whether it's gingivitis, whether it's periodontitis, if it's any of the oral diseases caused by biofilm, which is what these diseases are caused by, you know what you ought to think about? Just adding the words at the end of the disease diagnosis, modified by, and then say what it is. So today I had a patient. I had a patient come in and they had generalized stage three localized stage two, or they had localized stage three, generalized stage two, periodontal disease. It was active, but it was modified by a hemophiliac disease. And so mm -hmm. what we start to do is recommend what it's modified by. And we're starting to tell the insurance companies that, hey, not only do they have this disease, but it's modified by something else. And now what, what are we up to? How many, modifi how many modifying diseases are there? You know what? It's 57 different diseases today. And if you don't know what to write on the form modified by, modify by poor oral hygiene. Because if you don't, can't get the crap off your teeth, that's going to cause a problem for the, you know, for the gum and bone. So, Jeff, to your opening comments, it has come so full circle. It's so different than what we thought it was, that we could scrape the bacteria off the teeth with a curette and we could cure these patients. It's not possible. This is a medical issue with a dental solution. And what's good about it is the people who are watching this webinar are the only people who can cure or stabilize this disease. And that's a great thing for us. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we have been well recognized in the physician community because physicians know the science is so clear that you have all these bacteria. We call it biofilm now because it's also made up of yeast and viruses, which I didn't know even a few years ago. Uh, it's made up of yeast and viruses that contribute to this infectious process. And what does it do? It facilitates or has a cross relationship or a bi-directional relationship with now 57 other diseases. What a great opportunity in practice. If you just have the courage to talk about it, and if you have the resources to know what diagnostic data to collect. To and that, that's incredible that comment because you know in, in dentistry we don't ever think in terms of modifiers if you have yeah. not billed medical insurance you know most medical insurance claims that get put in have this icd code 
that has to have, it has a little decimal yeah. point. And then after the decimal point is what's called a modifier. And most insurance companies will reject a medical claim if there is no description of the modifier. So I love that you've described it that way, Doug. And in saying, because that really does have an impact on how we're going to target our treatment for a specific patient. Well, you know, let me say this. If you have a pregnant woman, you know, that comes in and a pregnant woman has gingivitis, it's just gingivitis. There's no significant bone loss, but it's significant gingivitis. We already know, Jeff, we have great studies that show that inflammation, just the inflammation is a negative con contribution to the overall systemic health of this patient. And if what's driving the inflammation, let's just say it's not hormone induced. Let's just say her system's more sensitive. And that because you're, believe me, when you're pregnant, your body's aware, you got an invader coming, I'm going after it because why we got not only you to protect, we got another little one we're gonna protect too. So guess what happens when you're, her body's on high alert and you have some invaders around the gum tissue your body goes into overdrive to, to, to just get rid of that infection. Now you have this gross gingivitis. What if you just submit the code gingivitis? But what if you code gingivitis modified by pregnancy? And then the insurance company says, you know, I don't think it's worthwhile. I said, why don't you write my patient a letter and tell them the fetus isn't worthwhile? And then and that you don't want to cover the you don't you don't want to cover, you don't want to participate in the encouragement to make this patient better, you write down the letter because you know, I'm not taking the hit for that. You yeah. write down the letter. You start asking your insurance companies to write the letter to a patient and tell them it doesn't matter. Watch what happens. You're going to get shit covered. You'll be surprised. Very interesting. I like the tie-in too, because I think you come at a very uh, poignant time in our profession, as I talked about before you came on. There's the commoditization. Is that a com is that a word, guys? It is, it, it is now. It is now. Thank you. I, yeah. I appreciate We're here the, first. We're here first. the forgiveness. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as certain parts of our industry are looking to commodity to turn dentistry into a commodity, uh, and Doug, you're you're championing on the healthcare side of dentistry. I think of this as a win-win for dentists. It's an ability to treat patients the way they truly should be treated and to, to provide adequate and phenomenal health care. But in addition, diversify the way that we think about dentistry and look at the way we run our practices in a different way so that perhaps we can continue to remain competitive and uh, proactive in our dental space to, to create niches for, for ourselves that won't allow Walmart healthcare centers and, and the large DSOs to squeeze out the small private practitioners. What do, do you see this movement uh, playing a role in that? I do. I totally do. But we have to change the narrative. And one okay. of the ways we can think about changing the narrative is think about it this way. You have a patient that comes in and says, I have an insurance plan and I get two profies a year. I get two profies a year. Profies are a preventative service. Yeah. Now this patient comes in. How many of us have these patients that come in? They got three millimeters of recession. They got interproximal bone loss. They come from another practice. They've been there for 25 years. They've had nothing in their life other than a profi their whole, their whole year. I had 99% of my patients, Jennifer, when I bought my practice were like that. They were all profis. Everything was a profi. But here's what I would tell a patient. You know, I think, you, and, and, that, and now this patient has, has obesity. They have diabetes. They smoke half a pack of cigarettes a day. They have, you know, I mean, shit, life happens, right? They got other things that are going to have sleep apnea. They have other things that are going on in their life. What if I said to them, you know, I think your insurance benefits are really being underutilized. And they go, what do you mean being underutilized? You have conditions in your body that relate to conditions in your mouth. And you know what? You should probably have four service appointments a year. That would be way more appropriate for your health and for what's going on. But you know what, Jennifer? The general practitioners don't have the knowledge and the courage to gather the diagnostic data to petition the company to do that. So guess what they're getting? Two profies? And guess whose fault it is? It's our fault for not taking the right diagnostic information and doing the right diagnosis and then petitioning the company and challenging them and saying, this patient deserves more than that. That's what we have to do. And when we start to do that, 
the underutilization of dental benefits is rampant. It's rampant. We're all bitching about what we can't get paid for. Well, you know what? Mm-hmm. Diagnose it. Diagnose it properly and document it and challenge the company to go on the hook and say, that patient doesn't deserve that. You write them a letter and tell them that and let's see what their benefits advisor starts to say when you get 50 of those letters or 100 of those letters. I'm starting to change the movement one letter at a time. And that's all yeah. I can do. And Doug, would you, would you not agree that a lot of that for many dentists is just comes down to friction that they yeah, don't of course they don't want to take the time and even in the dso model you know there's a lot of education first of all that they have to invest in for for their dentist to know what they're talking about but on top of that you know they run with a model of being very time efficient and if they can't be time efficient You know, it almost becomes this, well, I could get into an argument with the patient or I could sit here and try to explain it or I could move on and, you know, do my next quadrant of restorative. And and so I think that becomes the friction point. And I think that's why we're going to kind of see this resurgence of small group practices that are very successful because we're the only ones that can really provide that kind of a service. You know, Jeff, we've already seen some, we've already seen some significantly large failed DSOs. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you if DSOs are only looking to leverage the financial capacity of a practice and they don't have a health agenda, I don't think it's going to be so sustaining because the population is getting smarter and the DSOs are also realizing the small boutique DSOs. 50 practices, 100 practices. I mean, I'm not talking about thousands of practices. I'm talking about these groups are starting to realize we need clinical protocols that go along with our excellent management protocols. And I'm not going to promote any one DSO over another, but I'm in some really strategic conversations right now with the strain group, Kerry Strain and his group. And you might say, well, you know, it's not a big group. Well, you know what? There's going to be DSOs that carve out the space that have private equity funding, they have plenty of money, and I can tell you what they want. They want to do something different than the DSO that just wants to leverage you financially. Yeah, And that's going to make a difference, and it's going to create a better space for our young practitioners that are coming out and to align themselves with a group. Because, look, I get it. These guys come out of school. They got $450,000 worth of debt. That was more than, my first, that was more than the first two houses I bought. And uh, when you think about what the, what the costs are, for them coming out of dental school and where do they go in this quagmire and this sea of, of, uh, of groups of people that are offering them free tuition payback and uh, equity position and all this stuff. I'll tell you what they ought to do. They ought to think about aligning with some DSO that has not only a financial management agenda, but they have a healthcare agenda because that's going to be the future. And these DSOs are going to carve their way out. And I'm putting together a group of educators that's going to go in and help them succeed. I don't, I want to help them succeed, Jeff. I, I realize that I can't be, we all can't be independent sold business owners and be successful. And then I want somebody who buys my practice for, for 15, 20 times my profit uh, over somebody that I can, that, that I'm not going to expect any young kid to come out of school and have $500,000 of debt and pay me two and a half million dollars for my practice. That's not going to happen. That's going to be right. hard. No experience. That's impossible. I bought a practice for 400 grand. You know yeah. what their school debt is. That's not possible today. It's almost impossible. It's changing. It's it's changing the way we knew it. I got a cold call yesterday. They called me three times within an hour to try and sell my practice to a DSO. I get them all the time. And it's like, are you serious? You really think that I'm going to sell my practice to you just from a freaking phone call? Yeah. You know, <laughs> and that didn't it depends do it. how much, Chad. Yeah. And here, yeah, that's you know, what, you know what, Jeff. You know what, Jeff. You talked about you talked about in the beginning of this of this particular segment with us tonight. You talked about dentists with burnout. So you have no idea how many dentists are in their sixties. They're in their their early seventies, and they're like, if I just get the right number, I'm out. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I mean, and you know what? Some of these people are so concerned about who they're going to see in the grocery store. And are they going to, and, and someone would come to them and say, oh, thank you so much for selling my practice to Doug Thompson because he's such a great practitioner and what a nice guy. And, 
They don't care about that. They don't even care how you spell the last name of the new of the new owner. They just want to know what, just how much money can you can I get? Because I want out. I'm done with it. I want to be out. And what we need to do if we start to shift our if we start to create some draw for our practice that offers the patient a little bit more than just the restorative services. And you know what we're offering in our practice and in the integrative oral medicine fashion and what the wellness dentistry network supports is how to have patients have a little bit of increased vitality and longevity, which gives them trust and confidence in what you're doing for them. And they get stickier to the practice. They won't leave you for five bucks. Mm -hmm. They won't leave you for yeah. better hours. They won't leave you for a, they'll come to you and they'll go, why the hell can I have a better discussion with you about my health than I can with my physician? Exactly. What's up with that? What's up with that? And you know why? We have time and we care. Yeah. We have time and we care. There's no more compassionate group in the world than hygienists that want their patients to be healthier and yeah. happier. And, and one of the challenges for hygienists is they're not supported by the doctors. But the hygiene group is very passionate about this movement. But they don't have a platform to really practice this because there's so much pressure, financial pressure, other pressures in the practice. So I'm passionate about cracking this nut and I'll spend the rest of my life doing that. And that'll be fine because I'll get I have practices. We go in and we teach dental hygiene procedures and they come back two years later and go, oh, my God, I increased my hygiene production by 600 grand. And I didn't yeah. want to deal with those hygienists. I didn't want to deal with those people. But, you know, you came in and helped us and it was amazing. For me, that's enough. That's enough because it's unbelievable. And I know for every practice we convert, it's twenty five to three, twenty five hundred to three thousand patients are going to be healthier. And that's a great thing. That's a great thing. And that provides a lot of joy and a lot of passion. And it puts a lot of a pep in our step to be able to keep doing what we're doing. And I'm 60 years old and I'm just getting started. Doug, don't you think that that. Uh, part of what makes it such a sustainable model, especially as dentists like you and I that are getting towards the end of what would be a typical dental career, the, one of the reasons that makes it so sustainable is just the amount of time that we get to use our, our brains instead of our backs and hands mm -hmm. and just having these kinds of conversations in making people healthier. It, there's, there's, it's a very rewarding thing, but it also takes a lot of physical stress off of your body, which is, I think a lot of what burns dentists out, you know, their hands start to hurt, the neck starts to hurt, the back starts to hurt. And you're like, how many more fillings can I do today? I just, I feel like a hamburger flipper. So and, why don't and, you get, why don't, so then why don't you get 50% of your couple million dollars coming from your hygiene department? Right. <laughs> I mean, why, you know, yeah. why, I mean, you know, hygienists come out of school at 22 and, uh, you know, and they have a lot of energy and passion. So why not do that instead of ha having us do that work? Uh, you know what? You know, I go on the day sheet, you know, what the day sheet, the day sheet says I go, I go on the morning huddle. It's like, oh, Mrs. Smith, number 15. Oh, Mrs. Mr. Berger, number two. I'm like, could you stop with those number 15s and number twos? Could you give me like a number eight or a number nine? You know, I don't want to work on 15 and two anymore, upside down and backwards. <laughs> yeah. um, Amen, brother. <laughs> at, at, 60, at 60 years old, could you give me something? Could you throw me a bone? You know, so, <laughs> so, so, so I get it. I get how hard that is to do. And you know what we should do? I mean, if we have hygiene departments that are, that are really, uh, that are, uh, you, you know, that are more perio optimized, but, be, but believe me, Jeff, as you know, before anybody gets sleep optimized or any kind of optimization in their practice, they got to be aware. So you got to create awareness piece. And this is what the Wellness Dentistry Network's about. It's about creating some awareness and walking you more toward optimization. And when you get optimized, now you have practice numbers that more reflect the demographic numbers of the disease. Mm -hmm. if you have 65% of people have peril disease. Why do I only have 16% of my patients in peril maintenance? There's a big disconnect there, right? And I get the struggle between dental insurance and the wants and the needs, but it comes down to educate. It comes down to educating the patients, but it comes down to us being educated first. And that's where I think we're encroaching on a new era. It'll take me through my lifetime for sure. And that's educating practices on how to create more awareness in their teams 
so our teams can be better. So it's not like a one horse wagging train where the dentist is providing all the revenue for the practice, but you got a big hygiene team that's supporting it and that you're having a lot more fun. You're having a lot more conversations. We're doing a lot more in the practice, what we call FaceTime. I have a busy restorative practice. I run four columns of hygiene on most days. And believe me, the last thing I want, the last thing I want is four hygienists standing outside my restorative room telling me they're ready for an exam. That's a disaster in practice. I shoot myself mm -hmm. if I have that. So yeah. what I do is I tell my hygiene team 15 minutes into the appointment, I'm going to come into your room when I have time. And I'm going to come into your room and I'm going to do the exam when I have time. And you're going to give me the stage and grade of the disease right off the bat, or you're going to tell me they're clinically healthy, which means there's no disease and they're stable, and I'm gonna congratulate them, or I'm gonna ask you three simple words if you tell me they have disease, what's the plan? And you come up with the plan. I'm not coming up with that plan. And that's what we teach hygienists to do because that needs to be a self-directed program. It needs to be a contributory part of your practice for health and wellness, and I don't need you to do it. I want the hygiene team to do it. And so my, uh, my, uh, my goal is to teach hygiene teams how to make practices be successful, and believe me, for the hygienists that are listening to this, you need to be rewarded for with piece of the action, right? I want them to be compensated for what they do and uh, and the contributions they make. So I'm not about just the dentist getting richer, the DSOs getting richer, and everybody else being capitalized. I want everybody to share in the wealth. Well, it's it's not uh, you know it, it's no surprise that. Uh, the hygienists are all a huge fan of you, Doug. And uh, in fact, a couple of a couple of my ex hygienists since I sold my practice, and yeah. uh, some that are working with me now are actually on live when they usually watch this later. And it's only because you're on. So again, I'm going to blow your head up a little bit. But no, I I think that there's so much value to to giving autonomy. You know, some some bit of autonomy in practice together. When I say autonomy, I still mean working with the dentist in the practice, but saying, look, I'm going to educate you. I want you to take this on. This is your baby and you're going to be rewarded when it, when it does well. I, I just think that, that that just creates a whole new interest in the profession for them. And, and it saves a lot of hygienists from burnout. Yeah, there's no question about it, you know, and, 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 you know, our hygienists that have the ability to really speak and eloquently share what's going on without just overwhelming the patient. I mean, there's a little bit of skill to that. I mean, I think it can be amazing. Um, but hygienists are very, very passionate care providers. And I think that I don't want to overburden them with the work that they do in that hour or hour 15 or 45 or whatever you decide is right for your practice. But what I want to do is make sure that it can be as efficient as it can. And you can get the most out of that 45 minutes as you can, still maintaining a personal relationship because it's a personalized service and still maintaining that peace, but giving them the professional autonomy that they that they so well need and deserve. Uh, because Jeff, you got look, you got a busy practice to run, right? I, you don't you don't need to be micromanaging hygiene teams. And so my hygienists are competent to make an assessment. They're competent to make a diagnosis. They're competent to read radiographs. They're competent to create a plan. They're competent to do follow-up uh, uh, assessments as to who is successful and not successful, and then modify the plan. And they're also competent to help me, to help me uh, discuss things with other care providers. Now, whether you wanna have a hygiene care coordinator or you wanna create a position for that, I've been, I've been, I've gone out many of times uh, in my practice and hired a hygienist that I thought had great skill and competency, and I had no room for her in my practice or him in my practice. And as time went on, we, I, I pay, I paid them before they were, before I could really support the payment. But in time, they grew into a position in a practice, and it just blossomed. I have nine operatories. We have a very, we have a very robust hygiene practice. And, uh, but let me tell you what's happened since COVID because I want to be transparent with everybody online. My, my story is not all rosy. I got, believe me, my hygiene looks full next week, but you call me on Monday for a Tuesday appointment. You can probably get one. There's so much fluctuation 
and what's yeah. going on in patients one day and two and three days before the appointments. It's unbelievable. So who, so right now, who are the, that's pretty universal. I think Doug. Yeah. Yeah. Who, yeah who, I agree. Are, who are the amazing people in my practice right now? That freaking front desk people who yeah. are hundreds of phone calls a day to fill holes and to move people and to push people forward and to, you know, so, so it's, there, it's never been clearer than it is now, Jeff, it takes a team, right? You need a team of people. You need an admin team that gets it. You need a hygiene team that gets it. You need dentists and associate dentists that get it because the pressure's never been more. We have rising costs. As Jennifer mentioned in the, pre in the prelude, we have rising costs. We're not even keeping up with inflation. When you think about when I adjusted my fees last, it's almost embarrassing. Why? Yeah. Because I, I felt guilty about it. I didn't want to raise my fees. I, wanted, I knew the pressure was incumbent on everybody. But you know what? We have to because we deserve to make a profit and yeah. we deserve. We're providing a service that's unequivocal in the health industry. The physicians can't spend the time. There's not one single allied health professional that can spend the time like we can and that has the time and that has the knowledge to make a big difference. And if you think about what a hygienist can do to a patient <laughs> for their overall health, you intercept gum disease or gingivitis or periodontal disease in their 30s and you teach them how to stabilize that disease and you keep it stable for 20 years, you could be preventing the onset of Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes. So, I mean, it's, the list goes on and on. So it's an amazing so, opportunity for us in practice. And and I'm sorry, I, I keep jumping in because literally I, I could sit here and talk to you for the rest of the night about this because, you know, this is such a strong opinion of, of mine. And so I'm always happy to hear it, you know, from my mentors and, and you know, to have other people who feel this way on the show along with people like JB and Chad who try to provide, you know, this great patient care model. But the one thing that I will say is there is not another profession, as you said, that has the ability to impact so much healthcare outcome predictability as we do. I was amazed. My mother last year went through a quadruple bypass and a mitral valve replacement. Great cardiovascular surgeon, great program. And I was appalled at how little they talked about <clears throat> is your periodontal care in check. And, and so I began to have conversations with them about this saying, listen, I'd love you know, any of your patients, just tell them to open, ask them about their, their dental history, because we can impact, you know, the predictability and the outcomes of, you know, cardiovascular surgeries of um, certainly joint replacements. And, you know, a lot of physicians are in tune with this and in your area probably refer to you for this. We're, right. we're just, you know, they're, they're starting with the sleep apnea with me, but this is really where I want to go to say, look, the dentist can impact outcomes for everything that we're doing. Why are we not talking more with these people who have more control on inflammatory markers than anyone else in the medical profession, you know, other than, you know, a, a, a proctologist? Yeah. Jeff, you know, you know, I've always admired you. And this is why your program is called Dentists in the Know. It takes people like you, Chad, and Jennifer, who get on on a regular basis and try to offer up your time to help other people learn and grow. And I can tell you that when you have, when you develop, and I can teach people how to do this, when you develop a nice cross referral system with people in your community, physicians especially, and one of my most curious uh, referrals was from a physician in Massachusetts. I'm in Detroit, Michigan. I had a physician in Massachusetts refer me a patient from Belgium for an oral evaluation because they knew I knew I was going to do salivary testing, yeast testing. I was going to do certain kinds of, and we could come on and have a whole other show about this whole piece. Um, but to get a referral like that was so humbling and so respectful 
that I wanted to make sure I could deliver what that patient needed because they passed a lot of dentists on their way from Belgium to Michigan. And so, I, <laughs> so I can tell you that I can tell you that forums like this that are starting to educate patients are what more and more of us are going to need, more and more of us are going to want, and it's going to be valuable. But you are not going to get this. This is not going to be typically trained to you as a Walmart dentist, mm -hmm. unless they hire me to come in and teach their group how to do this. I mean, it's a it's a very it's a very interesting time, and you can carve out a niche in your community by networking with physicians. And I can tell you, when a physician refers you a patient with cardiovascular disease, or with early Alzheimer's, or dementia, or elevated blood biomarker inflammatory biomarkers of disease they have they have so much other disease and in my program if you ever come to the wellness dentistry network program one of the programs one of the closing comments is i got a guy who was referred to me for elevated hscrp and he spent thirty seven thousand dollars in my practice i had another guy who was referred to me because they wanted a dentist who understood how to manage cardiovascular stints and he spent sixty eight thousand dollars in my practice so I can tell you what's going to happen in the future. It's not going to come from manipulating some dental code. It's going to come from developing a brand and reputation in the community. And you're going to be a person who understands wellness dentistry and you know what to do. And you know what? Take care of the two biofilm mediated infections in the mouth that you should be expert in, periodontal disease and caries management. And if I can help you do that, that's going to get you going. That's going to be the springboard to a, a number of opportunities that you have no idea that's coming because it'll be amazing. Well, we're getting near the, the end of the show. It's about 926. So I don't want to let you go without giving the information to everyone who watches and, and will listen on, on podcasts about how do they get in touch with you? How do they find out more about the Wellness Dentistry Network, all the resources, all of the courses that you're offering, and, and how to begin offering these kinds of services in their practices. You know, Jeff, it's, not, it's really easy. They can, uh, if you, if my, my, one of my email addresses is Doug at wellness dentistry network, all one word wellness dentistry network. I know it's a big, long email.com, but if you email that, it's going to go into some cyber hole because that's my email address. I get like hundreds of those a day. So if you email contact at wellness dentistry network.com, my team's going to see it and chances are we're going to get it sifted out and we'll be happy to help you. And, you know, I didn't think about it. I really didn't think about it, but I'd love to create something for your, for your, for your group. I know you have, a, I, Jeff, how big is your following? What do you, what, what kind of following do you have? So right now we're near 5,500 uh, active members on Facebook and that doesn't include our, our podcast listeners Instagram followers and uh, YouTube channel. So how, so how about this? I, I mean, look, at, this is a nice opportunity for me. Here. You didn't pay me to come here and I didn't pay you, right? This is a, this is something you just asked me to do. And we just, there's a, there, in full disclosure, I have no financial, uh, I have no financial contribution and you have no financial contribution, no kickbacks, no nothing. But I would be willing to, if you could put something together uh, for your group, I would be willing to give a $500 discount. Our membership fee is $2,700. It's a subscription service model. And Jeff, you're part of it, so you know. And what happened to me, I developed this in 2016. So when you think about 2016, 17, 18, my, my yearly subscription fee in 2016 was $1,100. And now we're up to $2,700 to come in and join as a member our yearly renewal fee is $1,500 and it's fixed for the life of your membership. I would love to offer people that, Jeff, you have to help me come up with some kind of way to determine who they are, but I would be very happy to offer them a $500 initiation discount uh, off their initial membership fee. And the Wellness Dentistry Network provides them a whole library of resources, uh, how to educate the patient, how to help your team. We have a monthly webinar that we do with everything that's new, we talk about yeast management and virus management and bacterial management and perio. We have 23 other health and wellness modules, and we would be very happy to offer your group uh, a discount. And I don't, I don't typically do this, but I, this is the second time you've asked me to come on. Uh, it's a great night. I mean, we have a lot. Our messages should never be 
more fruit, more front centered right now. We have, that's why we told you to drink wine before you got on. We figured I, you'd no, I didn't <laughs> do that. But it, 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 it worked. Uh, but, but but we but I mean we have these increasing inflationary. I don't know where. That's what I said. I'm not talking about politics. I don't know where that's going right now. But I can tell you what. It's never a better time if you could if you could spend a few bucks and turn your hygiene team loose to the resources in the library. If you don't get your money back, you should call me because it would be a mistake. Something happened. Something was wrong in your office. I tell I tell hygienists, you know, if you learn the words about how salivary diagnostics is so significant to your overall health and you offer it to 10 patients and no one says yes, something's wrong with your words. I'll help you figure out what to do because I can tell you what, that's a concept that I have 90% of the people saying yes and 10% of the people saying no. So if you get no a lot, something's wrong with the words. Let us help you because yeah. it's, it's, it's an amazing concept and it's here to stay. Well, and, and I just want to piggyback on, on what you said about getting your money's worth out of membership. First of all, thank you for, for offering something for the dentists in the know. You know, we're, we're really proud when, you know, we're able to see our followers that are really trying to become better dentists, yeah. have an outlet to be able to do that. So you're offering that really, we, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate that, but to, to Doug's point, you will get your money's worth just out of the resources in the library. Literally half the things that people ask us as a question in Dennis in the Know, I could just say, go on the Wellness Dentistry Network. There's a form for that. There is an explanation of that. Like All of these things, we don't all have to individually reinvent the wheel you've taken a lot of time to put a lot of these things together and um and i know uh, a lot of my hygienists are on here tonight and and you know they could tell you firsthand how many of these resources have just saved them when they're talking to a patient and they're just able to print it out and actually our practice name shows up at the top of the page when we print it out it looks like something that we came up with yeah, we so, personalize all that information for you because we want you to have a personalized resource of uh, yeah. educational materials. And Jeff, to your point, is I would yeah, I know dentists have to write the check. I get that part, and I know if they don't understand it, they don't write the check. But you know what you're missing if you don't empower someone on your team to take the lead and run with it. If you would just support someone on your team who wants to do it, it will be amazing. And if you don't get your money's worth, call us and talk to us about it. We'll make it right with you. I mean, I don't want to take money from anybody that doesn't get value from what we provide. I, that's my mantra in practice. I do full mouth reconstructions. I have people come in and practice. I have a problem with the crown. I cut it off and replace it. You have open contact. By the way, don't ever tell me your contacts don't open up because they do. It's occlusal mismanagement. Yeah. If I have contacts open up, I cut it off. I replace it. I do it for free. And I do it with no questions asked because you know what? They'll hate you if you if you bill them for it again. So I just it's part of my guarantee. And it's the same thing with my network. And join our network. If you don't benefit from it. Well, I'll make it right with you. So I appreciate that, Jeff. And you've been a great supporter and your team's been a good supporter. Uh, we have 160 offices around the world. We're in seven. I think we're in seven different countries. And it's it, it's a concept that is here to stay. I don't have it perfect yet. I'm one guy, but I'm working just like you, try to make it better for all the people that care about us. And we care about them. I, that's why I love dentists doing business with dentists. I, I think there's no one better to understand how to create products and services that we can actually find a way to implement uh, very realistically and and uh, and do it well. And and we also have this incredible desire and need to want to stand behind our work 100 percent, just like you're doing with the Wellness Network as well, wanting to say, look, you're going to get your value. And if you don't reach out, talk to me. I mean, totally. No other no other business person does what dentists do, which is why and I continue to love this profession and the people we work with. Totally. Mike Lindell guarantees every pillow he sells. Well, I'm not talking about him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we weren't getting into politics. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I sold pillows. <laughs> uh, no, Jeff, the um, the uh, you have to help me figure out how I learn how I figure out who's who because what I don't want to do is I don't want 
uh, the offer to be hijacked. They say, oh, just tell them you're a dentist. You know, I mean, they need to be part of your group or part of your, uh, however you identify those folks. You, yeah, you we'll, we'll, uh, we'll brainstorm on that yeah. tomorrow. We'll have an off-camera discussion. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And and Dinks, look for that. Um, a special promo from uh, the Wellness Dentistry Network and Doug Thompson. Doug, I want to say thank you. We ran a few yeah. minutes over, but hey, with you, it's absolutely worth it. That's Always right. good information. Um, appreciate seeing you. And, and I think this needs to be at least a yearly thing where we can kind of update and sure. uh, hear what's going on with the network. Love. Support your hygienists and hygienists rally your patients to be healthier. It's amazing when they come in and they say, you saved my life. Jeff, I thought that was never possible. It's yeah. very possible. That's Absolutely. Awesome. All, right, All right. Thank you, Doug. I'll see you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great seeing Thanks, you. Doug. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hey, Chad, I talked no. a lot. So why don't you close us out? Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> didn't notice. You didn't notice? I, can't, hey. I get so excited when when these people that I've worked with for so many you know, I've watched them over the years and and you know I watched him way before the wellness dentistry network was ever a thought and so I watched his discussions turn into you know that this this great platform so yeah um I, love I that. apologize for for uh Hijacking a lot of the conversation, but um, I'll shut up now. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. It was a great show. Uh, Doug was fantastic. I mean, at sixty years old, look at that! Look at the, look at that head of hair on Doug. I mean, obviously, whatever he's doing is uh, is pretty fantastic. I... It, kept, it kept all this up here, so uh, so maybe we should listen to what Doug has to say. So. Um, uh, it's not just about dentistry. It's about the whole body. So thanks for so much for tuning in. This episode will go to YouTube. It'll go to the podcast. And of course you will get JB's news segment separately because she's so fantastic. Uh, so everybody <laughs> we'll see you next week. Have a great one. Love y'all. Good night. Good night. another podcast for dentists in the know on behalf of dr jennifer bell dr chad duplantis and myself remember that we've got a great profession so let's make it a great day dinks